So if you've been following my posts, you'll know I'm interested in understanding the impact that mulch can have on soil humidity on hot days. Specifically, I'm interested in knowing what the soil drying profile looks like over time for bare soils versus soils that have a covering of green yard waste or leaves. In this video, I'll summarize a bench tested circuit installed in my backyard for measuring the same, some surprising results from my first 24 hours of baseline measurements, and some improvements I'll be making moving forward. For those of you who just want me to cut to the chase, this is the first 24 hours of field data for temperature. And here's the humidity profile, measured the following morning after installation, once things had equilibrated. I'll discuss these preliminary results at the end of this video, including observations about high humidity in deep desert soils, and conclude by saying that for now, I'm focused on collecting baseline data and plan on making a few improvements moving forward. So my interest in mulch is sourced in part to some volunteer work I've done in my HOA as it relates to water harvesting in common areas. Where I live in the desert southwest, the idea is to use mulch to reduce the loss of moisture in common areas that my HOA pays to irrigate. The idea is not only to save water, but to create conditions for healthier vegetation without relying on industrial fertilizers. If you'd like to learn more, here's some additional background copied from Brad Lancaster's book, an excellent resource for water harvesting and permaculture concepts. I'll include a link in the description of this video. So here's a quick recap on the sensor side of things. In prior chapters, I've been experimenting with the AM2315 air temperature and humidity sensors and the encased SH10X temperature and humidity sensors that can be buried. Initially, I used a data logger to collect data from all three sensors resting on my bench in order to understand how well they compare to one another. Once I had confidence in the sensors, I set up an account on Adafruit IO so that I could log data to the Internet of Things. I then obtained a Feather Huzzah ESP8266, which allows me to post data to the Adafruit IO platform over Wi-Fi, and then set up a circuit for doing the same. This is a photo of the first experiment with the ESP8266 to ensure it wired and coded everything correctly. And here's data posted to the Internet of Things on a 30 second interval, confirming the circuit was robust. The next step was to migrate this mess of wires into something that's a little bit more field worthy, and that's really where this chapter begins. Initially, my plan was to solder everything to a proto board, but then I realized I could save myself a lot of soldering if I used one of these feather terminal boards with headers. These are convenient because with the terminals, I can quickly screw my sensor leads in, which also makes replacing the sensors much easier if needed. In order to do this, the only soldering I needed to address was installation of these pull-up resistors for the I-squared C pins talking to the AM2315, as well as for the data lines on the SHT10X sensors. This only took about 10 minutes to set up and solder. Upon doing so, it was just a matter of plugging in the Huzzah ESP8266 and attaching my sensor leads to those convenient terminal heads, requiring nothing more than a small screwdriver. This simple design will help me with a little debugging later on, as you'll see shortly. If you want to duplicate this, note that I couldn't find the exact same sensors I used in the Fritzing library, so I matched the colored wires that come standard with the SHT10 and AM2315 available through Adafruit to their respective pins. Overall, that process helped me turn this mess into this, something that's more easily managed and that can be installed into one of these solar-powered remote environmental monitoring boxes already summarized in a prior chapter of this series. So here's that Feather Huzzah setup migrated into that solar-powered enclosure. This was initially powered using a 2500 milliamp hour battery, which I upgraded to a 4400 milliamp hour battery based on experiments suggesting significant power consumption over a 24 hour period by that little Feather Huzzah. On the outside, I inserted the AM2315 air and humidity sensor in a white PVC tube in order to keep sunlight from directly shining on the sensor, which in turn can bias my temperature readings and also degrade the plastic enclosure. So, and let's see if you can see the sensor in there. And that PVC was just attached with a little JB weld. Then of course I have the two SHT10 sensors. You can see here that the um, that the cables are basically fed into the box through watertight fittings. 
And to help, I put a little zip tie here that prevents the cables from getting pulled through the seam and having them uh, disconnected from the uh, terminal blocks on the uh, feather huzzah. So I've also got some desiccant that I'm going to include in the box so that uh, my electronics don't get um, destroyed by humidity. Still need to figure out how to uh, uh, come up with a better way of preventing moisture from accumulating in these boxes. I think the best thing to do is not make them uh, uh, completely airtight because nothing is really airtight and what ends up happening is you get moisture accumulating inside these boxes and then when temperature changes the moisture precipitates out it can get into your connections into your into your electronics and really hose things up as I've witnessed in horseshoe draw. One of my first tests involved leaving the box outdoors in the sun for a few hours and then moving indoors to my workshop in the garage, which gets very hot during the day. When bringing it into the garage, I cool things off with positive pressure from a swamp cooler. And here are the results from that test. The two gray lines you see here show when I turn the swamp on and off in my shop, resulting in the temperature dropping and humidity rising in response to the same. Confirmation that the sensors are working over time is expected. I then placed it again in my home. And here you can see the results uh, with the AC cycling on and off, resulting in impacts on temperature and humidity as recorded by all three sensors responding accordingly. I then migrated the box outside and then inside again. And here you can see the temperature and humidity responding accordingly with all the sensors reporting fairly close to one another. All these tests are giving me the confidence that the code and wiring are robust for a field installation and reasonable data collection. Having said this, if the setup was going to support an outside experiment away from wired power, I knew I was going to have to rely on a solar panel for topping off the battery voltage using one of Adafruit's solar LiPo chargers. So the next thing was to figure out how I'm going to monitor battery voltage remotely using another Adafruit I.O. feed. Unfortunately, the Huzzah ESP8266 doesn't have battery monitoring circuitry, but it does have one analog pin that can be used to read my battery voltage. The pin for monitoring battery voltage is identified as ADC on the Huzzah and referenced in code as A0. However, since the respective analog pin is limited to 1 volt and your LiPo battery can put out up to 4.2 volts, you risk damaging your microcontroller if you measure that voltage directly. In response, Adafruit suggests setting up a voltage divider circuit to bring that LiPo battery voltage down to less than 1 volt. This is a photo of the protoboard I used to create the voltage divider circuit. I didn't have the exact resistances Adafruit recommended, so I had to use several resistors in series to get me in the ballpark to lower the max 4.2 volts off the battery to less than 1 volt, as you can see by the voltage divider equation. And this shows how I calculated the respective digital value for a 0.67 volt signal. Specifically, a 0.67 volt signal detected on that 1 volt analog pin will be registered in code as the number 685. In turn, I can divide my voltage by that signal to get a multiplier constant for converting that digital signal back into a voltage. And here's the resulting setup should you wish to build something similar on your own. Note that I included the results of measuring voltage on the ADC pin versus what is predicted from the voltage divider equation. And you'll see that the results were well within tolerance for my purposes. Okay, folks, I'm gonna run a little experiment here to make sure that my uh, voltage divider and my constant in code are reporting an appropriate uh, battery voltage. And the way I'm gonna do that is I've got my multimeter set up right here. I can measure the voltage off the bat pin on this little terminal block, and then I can compare it to what's being reported on the Adafruit IO platform. So you can see here that my last reading was about 3.93 volts. So let's go ahead and give it a shot. And I've already got the uh, ground lead off the multimeter. It's already been um, grounded. So now I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna put it on the bat pin, you can see that my reported voltage is about 3.99. So I'm about six one hundredths of a volt off of what's being reported on Adafruit IO. So 
Uh, close, close enough anyway for, uh, for my purposes. With that in place, here's the battery voltage feed added to the setup as the circuit recorded temperature and humidity outside. You can see that I'm getting a charge discharge profile that's reasonable on my hardware. Although my battery isn't quite making it to a 4.2 volt signal indicative of a full charge. Having said that, it appears my method is biased a bit low anyway, which is something I could address by modifying my constant, but for now I'll leave things as they are since it meets my purposes. Also, you might observe that the temperature on the SHT10s associated with the shallow and deep measurements are biased high relative to the air temperature sensor. But keep in mind that those sensors were baking in an enclosed REM box, whereas the AM2315 was outside the box, so some difference is to be expected. With respect to recording a battery charge, Adafruit does offer some code on its website that can actually give you a percent charge, and uh, I'll include a link in the description of this video if you're interested. So with respect to the field installation, the first thing was to hammer in a stake that I could anchor my enclosure to and also dig out a basin around that stake that's going to hold my mulch. And a quick thanks to my wife who helped me dig out this basin since my shoulder was a little sore on this day. Next, I used an auger with a drill to make a hole for my sensor with the least amount of soil disturbance possible. Accounting for the size of the enclosure, the sensor is probably about six inches under the level of the basin. I then buried the deep sensor and laid out the shallow sensor nearby. And then I placed some wraparound conduit around the cables to keep rodents or sun from damaging the same. Okay folks, it's all set up. I had to remove my, uh, my weather vane in the back, my weather station, because the uh, plastic was just rotting. But, and I'm just going to let this run for a few days and get uh, some baseline uh, data. And then we have all this mulch to do some experiments with. So, and it's just in the nick of time too, because it looks like the monsoons will soon be coming to us. Fat drops. During and after the storm, I checked my sensors uh, via the Adafruit IO feed and discovered that my deep SHT10 sensor was registering higher humidity relative to the shallow sensor. This led me to suspect that I may have switched the placement of the sensors, so one way to check was to immerse the shallow sensor in a cup of water. That helped me discover that I had a problem, given that my suspect shallow sensor that was immersed in water was yielding a signal on my deep humid feed, making me realize I had in fact reverse placement of those sensors. So this is the really cool thing about those terminal blocks is rather than having to take this thing apart and resolder it or unbury my sensors and bury them again, all I have to do is uh, unscrew those terminal headers and uh, switch the two data lines uh, coming out off of the SH10s. So it's gonna be the fourth and the eighth pin right there, and uh, that should fix it. So this is what the feed looked like before those pins were reversed and after the reversal, with the shallow sensor appropriately registering the feed from the increased humidity associated with being submerged in that cup of water. So the problem's fixed, but in the future, I realize I need to do a better job of labeling these sensors before burying them. And this is what the feed would have looked like if I had done things right from the start. All right, so lesson learned on that. Make sure that you mark your sensors as deep and shallow. Um, uh, know what you're doing before you start your installation. Uh, that's all right. I'm lucky I had this first rainstorm to clue me into the fact that something was going on. Unfortunately, the rain has cleared out. So we'll have to wait for the next rainstorm or um, We'll have to make our own rain with, uh, with that drip irrigation hose. So. And here's the data registered before and after the installation and fix. Here you can see that the shallow sensor is drying out over time as a result of being removed from that cup of water. And here's the resulting humidity profile that I shared at the beginning of the video, uh, starting at the next day once everything had kind of equilibrated. This also caught my attention since the signal associated with my deep humid feed is relatively high, close to saturation. 
Okay, so I'm kind of curious as to why I'm getting uh, soil moisture at depth when the profile seems to be um, relatively dry. So I went ahead and I just hand dug this little area right here just to see if I could spot any moisture at all. This kind of also gives you an idea of the soil that I'm dealing with. Um, in any event, uh, you can see it's pretty dry at depth. And yet I'm getting uh, soil moisture readings or humidity readings anyway, according to that sensor of about 85 to 90%. Uh, and it's pretty consistent. So I'm gonna have to do a little bit of research on this. In response to this data, I did a little research and discovered this website that provides a little background on humidity in soil profiles. There's quite a bit of physics summarized on the site, which I won't get into here, but I will highlight the conclusion being that even in what appear to be dry soils, there's still moisture tightly bound in the profile that is not available to plants. This can produce relative high humidity at depth, whereas shallower soils can experience evaporation in the layer near the surface, lowering their relative humidity much more effectively. I'll need to research this a little more, but assuming I understand this correctly, this in fact does mirror what my deep humid feed associated with my deep soil humidity sensor is reporting showing close to saturation at depth, whereas my shallow sensor is impacted by evaporation. This suggests that the SHT10 humidity sensor might not be the best to use to understand how much moisture I'm working with at depth, although it does help me realize a signal that is more in line with what I'd expect in the shallow part of the soil profile, even showing some dynamics over the course of the day. Given this observation, I'll talk about an alternative to humidity for measuring moisture at depth at the conclusion of this video. With respect to temperature, the results are a little more in line with what I'd expect to see. The deep sensor shows that temperature dynamics are being buffered over the course of a day as a result of insulation from overlying soil. I did notice this shallow SHT10 is reporting a higher temperature than what's being measured in the air during daylight hours. This is likely a result of soil surface absorbing infrared energy from the sun and releasing it as thermal energy around the sensor. And this mirrors what I sense when I walk on a hot sandy beach on a bright summer day. Given this context, the shallow SHT10 sensor will probably be most helpful for understanding temperature and humidity dynamics associated with adding mulch. So I'll collect baseline data over the next few days in anticipation of that future experiment using that sensor. Finally, I notice that the AM2315 is reporting air temperature that's a little higher than ambient by about five degrees. I suspect this is also a function of the sensor being relatively close to bare ground and maybe picking up a thermal signature, or it could be a function of the PVC pipe heating up and biasing the measurement of the AM2315 a bit over time. I'm not exactly sure, but it will be interesting to see what happens when mulch is applied as it relates to bias. I'll be picking up an analog thermometer shortly for a comparison. So as far as conclusions and lessons learned, I think that the SHT10 is better for measuring shallow soil humidity and temperature since Soil humidity is close to saturated at depth and will also be buffered from diurnal temperature dynamics at depth. So I'm not really sure what having a sensor like that at depth is really gonna tell me. Uh, when monitoring air temperature and humidity, it's a good idea to shade the AM2315 to avoid direct exposure to the sun. Direct exposure, of course, can bias temperature readings and probably isn't good for those plastic housings associated with that sensor. And if you're using a circuit with multiple sensors, consider color coding uh, your sensors prior to field installation. That's something I didn't do. And of course, uh, as I demonstrated, I got them mixed up. And by color coding your sensors, you'll ensure that you don't reverse their placement relative to what your code and your IoT feeds are expecting. And finally, I need to investigate what may be biasing the AM2315 by about five degrees Fahrenheit in this installation. That could impact how I go about realizing future installations for my agency where temperature and humidity are of interest at remote sites. Finally, in order to understand what's going on at depth with soil moisture, I suspect I'll be better off using a capacitive soil moisture sensor, which gives me a reading proportional to how wet the soil is rather than just reporting saturated air humidity. The Stemma sold by Adafruit also measures temperature, so that's something I'll take a closer look at in a future video. 
Well, I hope this video was helpful. Please consider subscribing for updates if you're interested in seeing how this experiment develops moving forward. Thanks for watching.